All right, welcome back there, you degenerate furries. Seems a bit harsh. I probably shouldn't do that. But anyway, welcome back, everybody. Today, we're taking a look at the brand new new information that's come out for the season six here. This is part two. There's also been a update that released, I think, a day or two ago. Might have been today, in fact. I don't know. The concept of time for me right now is just non-existent, as evident by the fact I keep, like, not uploading for over a week straight. <laughs> but either way. We're going to take a look at the brand new notes here, weapons, updates to maps here. Let's go over that really quickly then. So, first thing, part two, we got the legendary laser drill here, which actually looks pretty dang... I don't want to use advertiser on friendly words here, but it looks pretty nice. Uh, this weapon is a direct continuation. Uh, the familiar already triggered, the fans of this drill will definitely appreciate its older weapon, more durability, more damage, and a perk mechanic that is slightly more demanding than the player's skill, but also rewarding at the same time. If you have dealt damage to the opponents throughout the entire shot of the drill, uh, all the periodic damage damage dealt to the vehicles, then an end shot will deal 800% more damage and heat up the part by an additional 10%. Interesting. So essentially, uh, over the course of the trigger's weapon lifespan, or every time you shoot it, I should say, it applies this little laser that follows your cursor, and it's a very like precise. You got to be very accurate with it. Also, has a very nice turn radius and turn speed with it. So you don't have to worry about, you know, it being too slow. It keeps up with your cursor. It's pretty much instantaneous. So it's definitely going to be a lot more demanding on people who are going to be exceptionally great trackers here. I know for myself, I'm pretty in eh, when it comes to tracking here. Although strangely enough, I'm actually pretty good with auto cannons, which is more than tracking. It's tracking and prediction. But this will be interesting to see how this will actually turn out. That extra 800% there will definitely be interesting, because if anyone's going to have two or three of these at the exact same time, oh wow, that's going to be a hurting for a squirting there. Not to mention, too, imagine bots with this. Oh my god, I am going to fear any sort of bot in PvP or PvE that has this weapon. I'm basically going to instantaneously die when this thing happens. Because you have to remember, bots in PvP and PvE have precision perfect aiming. If only their weapons or builds actually allow for that. But assuming they're on like hovers with, you know, fully articulated laser drills here, this will be absurdly powerful on bots. Oh my god. Not to mention too, if you actually can precisely aim this thing at weapons, I can imagine this thing will become a very, very effective stripping for weapons. Even for large ones like the Mammoth or the Tsunami or anything like that, this will actually be excellent for that too. But alright, that'll be kind of nice here. As using this perk requires a certain amount of skill and dexterity, you also increase the range and rotation speed of the new laser drill in relation to the trigger. Interesting. The trigger itself already had pretty good turning speed already, so I can't imagine it needing even more than that. I never really had an issue with the uh, turning speed being too minimal. The only time the turning speed would maybe be questionable is when you're in literally the shortest range possible, like you're touching butts. But, alright, cool. On on that, we also got some brand new structural parts here. Which seemed to be mm, a bit iffy. But at the same time, they also continued the theme of the Founders, which is always nice to have. So if you have previous structural parts here, this will go great right on top of it. And it actually looks like these two are going to be uh, sister pairs in the sense that they'll actually mesh well together. Because it looks like this piece right here, I think it looks like it goes off to the side. So like it comes towards us in a little L shape there, like a hockey stick shape. And I'm wondering if that just like perfectly fits it or not. And either way, it'll be kind of interesting to see how that'll turn out. Other than that, we also have the brand new map here, or rather I should say, returning map of the Old Town. And it's been freshly renovated here. If you don't remember, Old Town was, well, essentially an old town, the name implies. I know, right? Mysterious. But it also was very infamous for having a lot of obstacles, a lot of places to get stuck to. I mean, bots would get stuck there constantly. I mean, bots would always get stuck on walls, random pieces, unable to reverse. It was just a very hard to reverse train. You had to be very careful. Or in the case of PvP matches, not careful at all and just get stuck. Unless you were a hovering person. But it was great for sniping and it was great for dog builds. So it'll be interesting to see how this changes. So one of the main problems in this location mentioned by players is a very limited maneuvering space. Narrow passages combined with an abundance of obstacles we try to add uh, more space and remove unnecessary obstacles and distraction. And there are places where it seemed appropriate we've replaced obstacles with destructible objects. So these things actually don't, uh, generally they don't interfere with movement at all. In fact, I don't think any of them do, but uh, I don't know uh, every single destructible object. But the ones inside like the driving range, generally they don't interfere with your movement. 
This underman has become more of an inviting place to fight due to the covers. At the same time, the variability of the passages is also there. You can always try and catch up with the enemy by surprise. So that'll be interesting here. As you can see, it definitely does look a lot more wide and open space here. You can see that the pathway back there is a lot wider. They actually added in a small pathway here, and the open space overall just looks a lot more open. And looks like they updated the textures to the uh, buildings. So previously, the buildings used to be like this gray texture with uh, moss covered all over it. Very looked like a very brutalist, actually, interpretation of like USSR and stuff like that. Now it's kind of going for more of a Bavarian theme, where you have like the wood beams interlaced within the architecture and the uh, more clay colored, I would assume. And it looks very much more intact with very minimal damage, except for over here. So it almost looks like it's inhabited and being maintained, but interesting how that'll turn out there. Looks quite nice. I appreciate any higher visual fidelity here. And just another side, too. I don't know, is it Bavarian styled? Because this one makes it look more like it's Spanish styled almost. And yeah, interesting, too, you have uh, much more of a mountain range back here, too. So they definitely improve the uh, skyline here as well. Very nice. Definitely do like seeing a bridge there. Surprising it's still standing after all this time, too, in the wasteland, but all right. But that appears to be everything for this season, or for at least this update. Let's go to the new one here, which actually does have some pretty crisp information here. So, of course, let's go ahead and go down here. Uh, next week, a new season, Enemy of My Enemy, we have launched in a crossfight. You can expect not only the new parts uh, announced to the dev blogs, but also a return to the Founders parts from the very first season. Interesting. So I'm kind of curious in this half season, then, with these half seasons, they're just going to jam in old stuff from previous seasons to kind of pad out the rewards, quote-unquote, you get from, uh, I guess, these seasons. Now they're doing two instead of one in the same time frame. But at the same time, too, uh, I'm curious as to the number of parts actually being introduced overall. Like, these new ones uh, being announced, will you actually be able to uh, get these with the previous pass, or you have to buy the new pass? And what does that mean for the new people? Do they get compensated? Does it just not do anything for them? It'll be interesting to see how that'll turn out here. This is say it will not be limited to new season only. It'll also include a PvP maps, special PvE mode, and balance changes. So that's all quite nice here. And again, this will be released next week, and this is on... Ooh, when was this actually announced here? Let me scroll on down here. September 16th. Yep, so it was released exactly today. So, yep, a couple days from now, we'll probably be announcing a new one here. It either starts on Sunday, Monday, or Tuesday, if I had to guess. Who knows? It'll be interesting to see how this will turn out. I do appreciate that the new parts are actually coming back from the previous season too. That's one of my big complaints I have with season is that as time goes on, more and more and more of this shtick from Crossout will eventually become inaccessible, which is uh, not really ideal for someone like me or for any a lot of people. You generally don't want there to be a plethora of content that you can no longer access either A, because you didn't buy the season pass, B, you didn't get high enough level in the season pass, See, you weren't there when it actually was out and about because quite a few people take breaks from this game that extend for months. So, great to see they're actually working on that. Will they double monetize it? Probably. Is that a compensation in a way? Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm conflicted on that. I don't like the idea of double tipping when it comes to already released content and selling it again. But at the same time, it's only really selling it again if you've never purchased it. So, okay. Or if you have purchased it, I should say. Next, we'll move on to the maps here. It looks like the bridge itself has been updated, which is fantastic. As you can see here, uh, this is where the uh, current bridge is. And this is generally where it is. There's like a boulder line that extends out on the actual current bridge map here. So generally right here, this boulder actually extends forward. And this path over here to the left does not actually exist. So this will actually be kind of interesting here. This will actually allow for people to get around into the back of the enemy lines without having to go through that river of death that's usually swarmed with porcupine barrels, wretchers, or other sorts of, like, hover builds that are just absolutely deadly. So that'll be nice. Rock on, my dudes. I think they also said they did a couple of alternative uh, changes here as well. But also slightly adjusted the height in the hills of the location to minimize the situation where an enemy can shoot the player just because he uh, occupies a position that is too high. That is very true. A lot of people, I mean, to be fair, that's kind of like what the map is for, is to be peeking and sniping oriented. But at the same time, too, I've also found that a lot of the uh, heights here have actually caused issues. Because a lot of the guns do not have very great uh, depth or ability to articulate up and down. So this will actually be great for people like that, mostly cannon players. MGs and shotties didn't really have too many issues with that. 
This one that's up and become more flesh, so lifting me more appreciated by the owners of armored vehicles on mechanical legs. Very nice. And to add to some degree, also larger builds on tracks with like screws or the armor track users that are very heavy or use multiple tracks. This would be greatly appreciated for anyone lacking power. New girls also appear on the riverbed on the hills and symmetrical descents into the riverbed appear on both sides of the bridge. Interesting. So there's now a descent on this bridge. Is he also talking about this descent too? Or if it's talking about like descent like literally right here as well. I think it probably means this one. But you forget the jumping hills either. Now the cliff drop offs will be less steep, which will reduce the chance of overturning the vehicle and also allow for more comfortable shooting from elevated positions. There's also the issue of these maps. If you actually go to a picture like this, and if you are actually able to pan right here, you would see two large hills. And one of the hills actually has a drop off that drops off with a bunch of pine trees out front. And these pine trees are so goddamn bad because if you roll off the hill accidentally or get pushed off it, there's a very high chance you get wedged between the tree and the hill and you cannot move and you cannot actually get out at all. So you have to sit there and either uh, suicide or just wait until someone shoots you. So I wonder if they actually dealt with that too, if they removed the trees or the obstacles that actually caused that. Or if they just literally reduce the height of it, so there's just less overall chance of you to flip around, since there's less time to flip around. But oh, interesting there. Next, we also got the Founders Canyon here. It'd actually be great if they actually released a full 360 map of this, but this will work too. But Founders Canyon here, you can see it looks pretty much the same as before, because you still have the noticeable multiple loops here. But it does look like there is a... here's the old historic hill. And it looks like they got rid of the cliff here because there used to be... Nope, the cliff's still there. Yep, I can see it. Actually, this map does not really look that markedly different, really. I did notice that there's a couple of flat hills back here. So these flat sections where my cursor is pointing. You can see these are generally actually where walls are. Because usually they try to funnel you between these two paths down here. But now there does appear to be a little bit of extra leeway here. Which will be great. Because generally what happens is that there's either a sniping match that goes on here. Or people just cower behind like these rocks until the bots push them forward. That's generally how it goes. So it'll be interesting to see how that turns out here. I'm actually kind of curious what actually happened in the background here. Because this looks like it's actually been changed ever so slightly. But I cannot tell because the map itself is not high enough resolution for me to zoom in all the way. But definitely does seem to be a bit more open here. Which I do appreciate. Minor changes will also fix the founders cannon. We'll strive for more viability in battles. And this location wants to diversify the usual standing still on the map, which, yep, I just talked about. A small side patch would allow fast cars to slip through the center of the map and cause more commotion on the enemy ranks. The location on the high ground will allow you to control the center and fire if necessary. So, interesting. This basically just allows people to uh, get around easily without having to go out in the open as much, which I always appreciate. It's not really going to be a huge, massive change, and I guarantee there's still going to be that cowering in the corners or behind the pillars, but we'll have to see how that changes. Next! We go into the balancing changes here. Oh boy. So the Spitfire here, if you remember from last patch, this thing got nerfed quite a bit. So what happened this time? Their ability to be planned to be reduced by 7%. Oof. That's not much here, but the fact is the Spitfire gets nerfed twice in a row. Wow, wasn't that overtuned? Huh. And the Rapid Fire M37 PSA. You know, it's funny they nerfed this weapon, but at the same time, this thing is also used so infrequently. All of those Rapid Fire machine guns are rarely used but cool to see those coming back but the damage is reduced by seven percent here apparently compared to all the close range weapons in its power score level i'd be fair all you really have for close range weapons is what melee shotties and rapid fires because everything else is kind of medium to long range next the next we got the cannon the prosecutor 76 millimeter now the cannon shells pierce two cells of the armor construction interesting I'm actually kind of curious what it was previously. Was it one cell? Huh. I mean, two cells is not bad, because two cells generally allows you to pierce through most light armor. Uh, heavier armor is generally two uh, cells or more thick. So that'll be nice. This is really only effect if you're, like, doing a bunch of, like, flat paneling on the side of your car. Like, if you're using nothing but, um... There's, like, a lot of those, like, Ava panels or just, like, minivan or caravan tops or... Uh, the canvas roofs. A lot of those are only uh, one cell thick, so it'll be interesting to see how that'll work out. Generally, people are going to put more effort into protecting their car, essentially. Cab cam mine layer. Now, it'll be easier for heavy vehicles to tear the cable. I mean, to be fair, it's really hard to tear the cable at all right now. Uh, the cooldown is planned to be increased from 12 seconds to 15 seconds, so 
Not bad. And it's to reduce the minimum time until the mine self-destructs from 60 seconds to 30 seconds. Nice. Does that mean after it's been activated or just how long it's actually been out in the field? Because I'm kind of curious as to what that means. Generally, I mean, the cables still feel pretty long when you're attached to them. But it's only because you usually are capped at, like, very inopportune times. Can't find this tune efficient and for sale, which allows to be used freely in battle against any kind of opponents. This changes the tendon to correct the situation, encouraging players to consider their strategy a little more when using the cad can. <laughs> I doubt it's going to change the strategy here, because usually it's just set it and forget it at any sort of heavily trafficked area. That's all people do is they just set it and forget it. Set it and forget it. Oh, you see a choke point? Set down four cap can mines. Set. Spike. So this one has had its damage increased by 8%. Very nice. To be fair, Spike is still not going to be even remotely meta or useful in the majority of circumstances, but cool, they're doing something at least. The only time the Spike was ever useful is when it used to flip cars. <laughs> I mean, it used to be have it used to have such a knockback power that it legitimately would flip over light cars really easily, and it would actually stop like most tank builds and like push them back a little bit. It was pretty insane how it used to be when it was first launched, and it was very overpowered. Now it's like super weak. Next, the Threshers. This is the purple one that just came out with the Guiding Star update. Uh, the maximum spread is planned to be reduced by 15%. Interesting. I guess it would explain why Thresher isn't utilized as much here. But it'd definitely be nice to see this, because I think the Thresher has a perk where it allows it to do more damage at a distance. If I remember correctly. I don't know. Let me actually go ahead and take a look at that. Okay, so the Thresher doesn't really have a perk that incentivizes long-range play, unlike the Retro here, which increases the damage for every 100 meters. But interesting here, damage increased by 7% for one second, stacks five times after hitting the target at a 20 meter distance, which means this thing has to be played very aggressively and very close. Interesting. Not really ideal for a lot of people, but all right, coolium. So now it'll actually reduce its spread by 15%. I mean, to be fair, when you're getting into the 20 meter range when it comes to the Thresher, if you're missing your shots, at 20 meters or less, you must be blind. <laughs> There's no way you should be missing your shot. Okay, apparently it's a very big thing here. Oh my god, are you kidding me? The caucuses, the weapon rotation speed is reduced by 25%? What? This thing already turns at a snail's pace. Caucus is a very efficient weapon with much less demanding to players skill than its analogs. This change should add a new layer of gameplay while using this weapon. Players need to efficiently control this armor card to unlock the potential of the caucus. It means everyone's just going to throw on an oppressor on their car. That's all they're going to do. Oh my god. Because the issue is, you know what this means? It's that players are going to have to play from a longer distance away and drive slower and in more straight lines. That's the only thing it's going to cause you to do. Which is already a big issue on the caucuses because that makes you a huge target for stripping. I mean, the thing is, these things only have, like, what, 300 points of durability or less? These things are not very durable. Let me take a look here. 284, that's not even 300 anymore, that's right, because they nerfed it for whatever reason. My god. I don't think... When was the last time these things have been buffed? <laughs> these things haven't been buffed in a hot second. Nor are they even popular, but alright, cool. Kick my balls even more there, Tarjem. Kick my balls even more. Alright, Icarus 7 here. Acceleration is planned to be reduced by 10%, and the PS has been increased by 100 points here. Dang! Dang! So for a 4 hover build here, this means your build increased by an extra 400 power score here, while also being a bit more sluggish. Interesting, interesting. But alright. To be fair, hovers are still going to be overperforming regardless. Especially at the higher tier upper echelon, where it can be controlled a little bit more, but it's still very dominant. So, definitely be interesting to see how that acceleration change plays out. Grenade launcher, Young Wong. Now, the maximum bonus for this perk will be 95%. Spark 1 and Spark uh, 3, sorry, Spark 3 and Flash 1 will no longer destroy the projectiles the moment the grenade launcher fires. Oh, yeah, I can see that being very damaging, because that used to be a big issue with porcupines, but they didn't have any HP. Spark players would just go up there and instantly pop the barrels when they popped inside of the car. So when a spark got close to a porcupine build, the porcupine build couldn't fire him. Otherwise, it would kill itself in like two seconds. So very interesting there. I'm actually curious as to uh, the current perk. So where even is the Young Wong? Okay, so damage increased by 50% for each unit spent on hardware. Interesting. So what was the previous maximum? Because the maximum is not listed here. 
I'm guessing the maximum is like 50% or something. Be interesting to see though. The thing is, how to get that perk to 95%? So how many energy points would you even have to spend there? Let me get the calculator app out here. So if you're doing 95 divided by the 15% per hardware, you have to spend a minimum at 7 energy to get that full perk. Can you even spend? Because you have, what, 9? It's 9 energy, right, for this whole thing? Alright, so... Yep, you have to spend literally every other single point of energy on hardware. Which I'm curious as to what is considered hardware. So that'd be energy... I guess shields, yep, that would be a thing. Chameleon would be a thing. Radar is going to be a thing. Alright, so there is a way to actually spend more. And of course, you'd be buying the reload uh, on this as well for the extra reload speed. So it is possible. I was just trying to think, it's like, is there really enough hardware modules to justify this? Although I can imagine seeing a lot of people just slapping these on their car. Oh, uh, no. It was a nice low energy cost, low power score item they could throw on your car. Not really too much here. Maybe the Argus. But interesting, nonetheless. I mean, to be fair, once you start spending that much on there, you kind of deserve it because you're going to be in like the 10k power range. So you're definitely going to need that when it comes to the Yang Long. Started to show effectiveness against after the Dead Man's Cabin was introduced. And the first change is to a correct situation. The second change is implemented to minimize the impact of the first change on Leviathans armed with this weapon. Interesting. So this is aimed primarily at Leviathans? I mean, I can't imagine too many Leviathans racking up two of these bad boys on there, but interesting. I mean, considering that your Leviathan can actually use two of them without an energy penalty on there, but at the same time, that's 18 energy spent on two weapons that could easily be stripped with like a good cannon shot. But all right, Harpoon Skinner. Now the Harpoon will hold the enemy in the car for only four seconds. you able to track when the Harpoon releases the enemy and help with a uh, special scale around the site. This change is relevant only for enemy vehicles if so the Harpoon is attached to the surface surrounding object terrain. The cable will not automatically unhook. Interesting. Interesting. So this is gonna hugely nerf Skinners. Oh my god. The ability to infinitely hold a car was a huge detriment when it came to the Skinner. Especially if the Skinner was able to harpoon onto your cabin, that means essentially you would not be able to shake them. The only way to really effectively counter that was to either flip the vehicle get rid of the Skinner, or just outright kill the vehicle that had the Skinner on it. So, interesting. This is definitely going to hurt a lot of melee builds. Although, to be fair, if a vehicle already manages to uh, skin you and the cable automatically detaches, you're probably already either A, donezo, or B, uh, probably getting pinned by the vehicle. Because right, right now, it is still very easily for lightweight builds to pin in very heavy builds. So, it'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Next is a mammoth. Reload time is planned to be increased by 10% from 6 seconds to 6.6. .6. Alright, alright. Never really noticed the mammoth being excessively efficient here, but alright, cool. Why not? It's a very minimal change too. I can't imagine it being like uber impactful. Drone the Annihilator. Drone's durability is planned to be reduced by 15%. Oof. Now the perk will reduce the cabin's power by 4% instead of 5%. So it'll reduce it ever so slightly. The damage is reduced by 7% as well here. So an excessive efficiency, and was quite difficult to destroy even with weapons designed specifically for this. Not really. I never found an issue with uh, killing the drone. The only time I ever found an issue with trying to eliminate it was when I would always try to fire at it, and then it would fly away. Because it lost line of sight, because you have to maintain line of sight when you use this thing. But interesting. I'm kind of curious as to the perk. How many times does that stack? So let's see. 5% for this one, 4%. So it stacks 10 times. So instead of a maximum being a 50%, it is now a maximum of 40%. Okay, so that's pretty good. And what was the perk? Was it for just movement speed, reload speed, speed, and acceleration? So it made you pretty slow. 50% is a lot after all. Especially on probably like hover builds. And to be fair, the Annihilator, I guess it could be a bit problematic if you're on like a hover build or weapon that can't uh, really articulate upwards. But alright, cool. To be fair, I still think the Annihilator drone is still going to be like ungodly expensive. Yep, it's still three grand, even though it's uh, tanked here from 3.7 to oof, down to three points. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Everyone canceled their buy orders for this as soon as this nerf came out. Oof, that was a major nerf, but it's still not enough to reduce it that much. I mean, compared to all the other legendary weapons on the market, it is still up there as one of the more expensive ones that you can get. 
I mean, I think the only cheaper one... The only one that's been consistently cheap is, like, the Aspect and the Tsunami, which, again, still holds true. But yeah, like, everything else, still doing pretty alright here. Yeah, you can see it's still up there being one of the pricier weapons here. Other than, like, you know, the mainstays that have been meta forever. Interesting. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh, look at that. You could even uh, make a profit trying to flip it. I wouldn't try it. But maybe this is probably the only way right now you can get a drone for less than 3k. Nice. To be fair, though, I was a big fan of drones initially when I first played Frost Out. I kind of want to get back into them, but not at this price point. Toadfish. Now the crossbow reload. 15% faster. 5.17 seconds in 6 seconds. Alright, cool. I mean, to be fair, though, Toadfish, still not going to be useful, but... Good try. Punisher, activate this perk, you'll need to make a... Not activate this perk, you'll need to make a... 30 precise shots instead of 40. Okay, so that's pretty good. Does that mean to make it 30 consecutively, or just 30 overall? That's still be nice, though, because 40 shots consecutively, or at least precisely, is still quite difficult a lot of the time, unless you're just, like, spamming the crap out of this. And this will simply change uh, the efficient use of this weapon's perk, which is always nice. Hopefully there's not a lot of times people accidentally use this perk. Next, Impulse, Accelerator, Scorpion. Damage plan to be reduced by 7%. Oof. Durability to be reduced by 10%. Oof, that's actually a pretty decent chunk. And the Master's plan to be reduced by 20%, which is, okay, that's all right. Then you'll be able to armor it up more, but at the cost of that, you will not have as nearly as much durability here. Plus, the reduction of 10% DPS there is going to be pretty substantial. After reducing the size of the physical projectile, Scorpion became more powerful as changes intended to make the Scorpion more balanced. Please notice the hit from the two Scorpions can still destroy weapons. Scorpion and his ratio of strength was improved. Okay, so that'll be interesting to see how that changes out. I guess, yes, yeah, since the projectile actually got smaller, it would be much easier for the Scorpion to precisely hit one thing instead of hitting like 15 armor parts and then your weapon. So it's probably a lot more better at actually stripping if you're accurate. So, interesting. I guess this will actually bring it back more into line after the previous buff. Other changes with the updates released, you also expect a special mode related to the new season, similar to Operation Gozu, which was launched in the previous season. We want to reveal all the cards right now, so look details, be surprised. The next idea is plan to improve the mechanics of the player matchmaking and clan battles. Changes first of all, she reduced the waiting times of rivals in higher leagues, so... Most people, not gonna be an issue. To be fair though, people don't like playing clan wars. Looking forward to welcome Enemy of the Enemy updates. See you in the next season! Woo! But I think that's all of the news right now. So, so far, it's actually looking pretty interesting here. The only thing I would say right now I'll be big concerned of with is the lack of parts they've really introduced. Because I think right now they've, what, shown off two brand new armor parts and, what, three weapons? Four weapons? Not very many stuff here. Not to mention, too, that this is going to be a rehash of the previous season. Does that also mean you'll see a return of, like, previous cosmetic items here? And if that's the case, then at that point, you're not really going to be having nearly as much flair. But we'll have to see. That'll be actually for us to determine once the actual, like, season rewards have actually been announced here. And you have to remember, too, this is only a 45-day season instead of the previous 90-day season. So it's going to be probably a bit shorter here. Downside, still probably going to be the same price. And I'm still absolutely living they nerfed our yield caucuses again here. I actually wanted to see what the win rate of these caucuses is. Because I can't imagine the win rate being of the caucuses being like above 50% here to actually warrant such a uh, nerf to its rotation speed out of all things. But alright, I think that'll be it for everything here. So what do you guys think about the brand new season information here? Are you excited? Yay or nay? Leave me your thoughts down below. And other than that, I want to thank you all for being here. And just as a quick update, I'll probably start actually introducing other videos here other than Cross Out. I'm thinking about potentially doing some like City Skylines playthroughs or... Other sort of stuff like that, because right now, I feel like, uh, we need, uh, we need to diversify the content here. Although, I guess I could also just start doing, like, streams of, like, other video games, but you guys don't really seem to enjoy that as much. But let me know what you guys think about that. Is there any sort of content you prefer? Yes, no, let me know. On that, I want to thank you all for joining us. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.